Thank you, Amanda. I think uh, all of us can agree that Amanda has laid out the basis of the different kinds of leadership. We've been talking about strategic leadership. She's now giving us some uh, very good historical background on transformational leadership that have been very practical that you have seen for yourself. Uh, let me thank the Africa Center also for giving me the privilege and opportunity once again to share experiences with our colleagues from the continent in a way that will benefit, uh, benefit all of us. My intent is uh, pretty much to just remind ourselves of what we always talk about <clears throat> in a way that uh, you can appreciate some very key buzzwords that leaders that talk about be it transformational, strategic leaders, or leaders exercising authority that has given them that you need to have in view in you. Those characteristics will try to help you in putting yourself up there as the next generation to lead the security sector in which you aim to lead the different offices that you are personally, personally holding. So I will try my possible best to see what are some of those characteristics that should be embedded in you that people can easily identify or your actions will definitely, demo, will definitely demonstrate that. So you will want to find out from yourself, we keep talking about strategic leaders, strategic leadership, transformational leaders, but what are some of those things that we need to have embedded in us? As we go back as captain or commanders, as we go back as generals, as we go back as officers, directors, ministers in the different offices that we have. It is easy to say you are a leader than to see you practically trying to demonstrate that. So one has to see that in you as a character. Something about you that people need to recognize and appreciate. Is there a sense of integrity in what you say that is believable? Because when you're training soldiers, and soldiers are under your command at different levels, they trust you when you say charge. They trust you when you issue your orders. So there is something about the training that you underwent as an officer for them to believe that those orders or statements you are giving should be something that they should believe in. So that helps to make you to be seen as someone that can trust. Someone whose integrity makes a lot of sense that they can believe and they can begin to follow. Similarly, if you are a layback leader, for example, it makes it difficult in a very hectic environment for one to rely upon you. Um, and I'd like to just give you one example of that. In April, on April 16th, there about in 2006, President Sullivan and her government had just come into power. And we had about hundreds of thousands of demobilized soldiers in the country who were demanding more than the demobilization package that we're giving them uh, at the time. And they went on rioting. I was in the office in the Ministry of Defense. And uh, everybody fled, pretty much. Uh, the citizens uh, fled the street. The soldiers uh, that were in the front came to the back. Civilian staff uh, bonded themselves in different offices. The UN peacekeeping force were on the ground. And these individuals got in the middle of the street and were burning tires. One expected that probably the minister would flee the office. No, I did not. I chose to stay. Because the authority of the Minister of Defense and in the mindset of the people have to see someone that, that they believe that what he's doing is the right thing. Long story short, eventually we're able to get to Unmill and through the efforts of the uh, commander in, uh, in Monrovia, they were able to bring the situation under control. But the action goes to demonstrate that people have to trust you. They have to believe that you're not going to wrap up immediately and flee, having been put in a position where they expect you. So one has to be a little bit assertive in the things you tell them that it, it is believable, that something they themselves can believe and follow. Was it a challenge? Of course it was. It was the challenge of the authority of not only the Minister of Defense, but also the integrity of the government. Because President Salif had already said that the international community had already provided funds for the demobilization process. And we had to stick to the ground that, in fact, there was no law that gave us the authority to do any more than that which had been done. So that was one of the first major challenges she received. In fact, that was the second challenge she received. The first one she got was on the eve of inauguration, two days before inauguration. The widows of thousands of people who fought the war, I mean thousands, barricaded the city and were mashing towards the state house or what, you, what we call the executive mansion where the president was. 
all the international dignitaries who would have been arriving in two days' time for the new government to be ushered into power. President Selim left the comfort of the executive mansion against the advice of the security people, and she and I went out to meet these thousands of very angry people. She was able to calm them down by her presence and ask that these discussions take place after the inauguration to see whether the veracity in the demands that they were making. That was one of the major challenges. It tested her ability. It tested the ability of that leader to go out there and face a major challenge that even people were afraid that something would have happened. It was a very calculated decision. So it wasn't a careless decision, but a very calculated decision based on the challenge that she was facing. So it is easy, again, to say I'm a leader. Then when you are faced with challenges that people expect you to cross, to cross those challenges. And we say to ourselves, sometimes it is better to go beyond your comfort zone. She was sitting in a mansion. She didn't need to leave the presidency. She could have sent the Minister of Defense. She could have sent the Minister of Justice. She could have simply issued an order or something to clear the street. But she chose not to. She took that step and went. And she was leading by example. And of course, I was right by her side. And both of us went down there and were able to talk to these people. Secondly, one issue that, Bennett, that if you look him across, we have a little semblance of formal education. That helped us a little bit. That little education we had, whether it is a high school paper, whether it's an education from our cultural background, whether it's an education in the formal setting with a graduate degree or postgraduate degree, we were able to use that to articulate the views that we wanted to present to them in a way and a manner in which they can appreciate. And the training you are presently on going now is part of that building block. For many of you who were trained as officers or senior NCOs or in a different civil service position, you went to setting training. So it is that training that begins to serve as a building block for you as a leader as you are, as you are proceeding ahead. And as you work and leave one job to the next, you get promoted from one office to the next, you bring along good experiences. People always say experience is a good teacher. It is true, but they got bad experiences that you don't want to bring along. Because those bad experiences, if it get repeated, probably is not a good thing for you as, as an emerging leader. So it's very important for us to recognize the kind of work and experiences that we have. Now, what kind of leaders are there? You can call it transformational. You can call it strategic. But I like to describe it as those who are waiting for things to happen. They totally lay back. They take no initiative and criticize everyone. And in a group like this, they'll be having private discussion and assuming that they know it all. If you want to have those traits that make you to be somebody who will be in charge in the future, be it a military commander, a senior civil servant, a future minister, or somebody of that sort, you need to understand that you have to get out of that box. If you're one of those waiting, you accept the status quo as it is. They send you somewhere to manage an office, you manage the office very well and leave it exactly as it is. You make no changes, you don't want to disturb the, uh, the beehive, everything looks very fine, and you leave it exactly as it is. That's the kind of lady you want to be if you're waiting for things to happen. And you complain all the time. You criticize every day anything anybody does. You have criticism. When they ask you to make a suggestion, you, you say, well, I'll be right back. So then why were you criticizing? What if you have ideas? Bring those ideas. So leaders, you have to see things that you should not be doing. So these are the kind of leaders that are there who sit and lay back. And they like Sasho. Sasho simply means they are not focused on that which is supposed to happen, that which is supposed to be achieved. They are pretty much leaving what everybody else is doing to get things done and probably playing on the internet or probably on social media, why Amanda was lecturing, for an example, or why your, your boss was discussing in cabinet. You are probably responding to a text or an email. Those kind of attributes will follow you later on when you become somebody in the position of trust. And finally, they're quick to jump to conclusion. By the time you say hello, they say good evening. You don't even respond to say hello. And they jump quick to conclusion. So it's very important for you to see what that kind of leader is. And I hope, uh, you know, as the course goes by, we'll not find ourselves into that 
setting. And there are those who love to make things happen. Those who get somewhere and feel that the chairs are not sitting correct, the flower pots are not correct, the microphone is not handling well, the bathroom doesn't look the way it's supposed to be, um, the staff are not motivated, and whatever. It's very important for you to see yourself getting things up. They are capable of taking initiative. i give an example. In 2006, when we were Minister of Defense, 94 persons were trained, were being trained, because we have over 300 plus civilian staff in the Ministry of Defense. We took the bold decision to get rid of the entire 300 plus staff and ask everybody else to apply on the basis of the following criteria to become a civil servant under these specific portfolios in the Ministry of Defense. And having gone through that process on the order of merit, we put them through um, six months training that were assisted by our international partners, and we were managing the Ministry of Defense, slowly building up and paying everybody to get off the Ministry of Defense. Upon the completion of that individual specialized training, we never had just anybody who was just on any title. Everybody had a functional title in the Ministry of Defense. We were the only institution in government that we could tell how many staff we had, the whole government. We were the only ministry that could tell you, I got 94 staff. Luckily for me and you, one of them is here today. He was recruited in 2006, strictly on the order of merit. And then what did we do? The same thing with the military. The entire military was laid out, and everybody was asked to apply on a new criteria. And it was a huge challenge because our partners felt it would have been extremely difficult to find people to come in to serve. But we created a model that made it possible that it could be done. When they said the officers should be high school graduates, we challenged them and told them no. In order to become an officer, first of all, we could qualify and recruit as an officer, we go for officer training or for officer candidate school, you must come with a four-year college degree. And we insisted on that to happen. So today, all of our officers, 100% are college graduates, the field grade officers have advanced degrees, and the general grade officers, of course, higher, higher degrees over the past 12 years. We've been able to demonstrate that it was possible. Did we allow any gender, uh, gender imbalance or gender parity? No. As a matter of fact, the first female who stood in the line to be recruited as an officer today, she is a brigadier general and she's the deputy chief of staff. So it is possible that as a leader to get things done, you must be very clear in your mind where you want to be. You be very much assertive. And don't accept the status quo as it is, even when you are challenged. And don't be content with things as they are. They might tell you, oh, it is not possible. It is possible. If you remember in um, September of 2014, when Ebola was raging, and the whole world was watching what was happening in, in, the, in the manner of basin of Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, when the CDC went to Liberia and announced that given the skill and the statistics of the death and the scale of this disease, about 10,000 persons will be dying every day. That was the official prediction that was made. President Salif called these experts, along with the cabinet, and challenged them that it is not possible for this to happen in her country while she was president. She then went on the national radio and called the attention of the entire nation and spoke to the hearts and minds of the Liberian people and told them that the destiny of the country is in their hands. They have to stop the spread of Ebola. And within six weeks, Ebola started scaling down. And within three months, liberals declared Ebola free. It took leadership and guts in the midst of experts who were assisting the country. So you might face a similar situation, but to arrive at such a position has to be built over a period of time of characteristics and traits 
that will be imbued in you over a long period of time by training, by education, by practice, that eventually you are able to challenge the status quo in a particular regard. And don't be afraid to go into the unknown. Like President Shelley would say, eight hours is not enough if we have to rebuild our country. We go to work from what? Eight to five, nine to five, and we go home? No. She's at work until about 11 p.m., and she's at work about 7.30 the next morning. So it became something we all had to do. Because what? She was leading from the top. So it's very important that as you grow up, as you get grow up in your positions of trust and a position of confidence, you need to find yourself in a way that you can distinguish what you say by what you do, by what you act, and how your peers and others can evaluate the performance that you're giving. Everything will not be rosy. You will be criticized sometimes. And I remember she was, uh, she was also challenged by someone who was on a radio <laughs> on a daily basis. He wouldn't stop. I mean, he's on her back. Even if she gets on the plane, he's going to criticize the plane she gets on. Even if he choose to ride your ordinary business class, he will criticize why he didn't, why she didn't ride economy class. That there were people who were fooled. Even if she went to the Air Force meeting with just three persons, she will criticize why she couldn't just send the ambassador. I mean, it was on her back regularly, but President Kelly will always tell you, stay the course. Meaning, keep your focus on the big picture as a strategic leader. Don't allow distraction to bring you down. And so I think it's very important that we begin to, to look at that as well. So once again, we all know the big saying, strategically on what? Set out on a what? On a vision. Where do you want to go? I'll give you a small example. The, um, when we started in the military, for an example, the military pay skill was at this level because the government had no money. So the soldiers and the lieutenants and all their field skills were at this level. But we projected that over a 10-year period of time, the peer skill would have gone up probably by about 300%, about 270, 300%. Now the estimate would date. And indeed, yes, today the peer skill, if you were to do the calculation, it went up exactly by that much. Because we felt that the economy would have grown at a certain level and that the government budget would have been able to accommodate these pay increases over a period of time and therefore, we were able to do that. But it was very difficult because people went into the military with different expectations, which means when you are leading people, people will come in or you are leading with different expectations. Some expectation beyond the purpose for which you brought them in in the first place. You have to find a way to manage those expectations in a way that it can appreciate by allowing them for them to look straight and way ahead, way ahead of that. And you can't be so rigid all the time. Sometimes you have to be flexible in some of the things you want done. By the time, you have to be very firm and very bold. I'll give you another example. If you were in Monrovia, um, there are several locations, but I'll give you just two. The former combatants were hosted in a, in a building right outside the outskirts of town, where we call Congo Town, in the old Ministry of Defense. There were about 420 of these armed combatants. And the UN had not bothered them because the UN felt they were like a honeybee set. If you disturb them, it will cause chaos. But they were in the middle of a government project. They were in the middle of a program that would have probably brought in some benefits or to build a new ministry or a ministerial complex. And the government needed to get them out. And of course, some of our international partners didn't think it was time. I went and told in the cabinet, the decision was taken that it was time to get them out. And I was asked to lead the process. Well, if you understand psychological warfare, maybe we need to talk to our colleague Anwar back there to help us on that. But yes, yeah, that's what we did. So what did we do? We put in place a, a string of campaign of information of a date from the beginning, a date to the end, uncompromising on those dates. So everybody expected a head-on collision with former combatants and ex-soldiers that the government wanted to get them out, there'll be a conflict. But we were able to successfully get them out without a conflict because we exercised their leadership by going to them and talking to them. But there was a lady who was a captain, a retired captain, who was running a private school in this facility. She came to the Minister of Defense and said, Mr. Minister, I can help you to get all of these people out. And I said, how? She said, help me to relocate the school 
on GSA Row. If you go there now, she's there with her school. So help me to relocate these kids on GSA Row, and I'll get these people out. How much did it cost? She wrote, she atomized what she needed, the transportation, the chairs, the benches, the board and chalk cattle books and things. And the government was able to provide the little funding to her. By the end of the three months, the evidence is there. Not a single incident happened. Everybody were relocated. And the building was turned over to the government without any issue. But I also tell you something else that happened in Iraq. That was a story given to me by a U.S. four-star general uh, from the Marine Corps who visited the library of a team of officials just on the eve of uh, New Year. And he tells us the story of uh, why in Iraq, and that uh, there was this tribe that they were trying to manage and settle in this particular area. They have sent every commander there. They've given them incentive. They're giving them money. But this tribe was very difficult to manage. So he gave the task, the same resources to a female officer. The female officer went and bought almost the same cow, the same thing that everybody had been buying. She bought the hundred cows and donated the hundred cows to the village. And what happened at the end? That entire tribe in that village became hospitable to the Americans and assisted the Americans in getting the job done. Do you know what she did? She went and bought only pregnant cow. So that each person given a cow had what? The potential for two cows. And everybody was very pleased. It took innovation to get it done. You have to think outside of the box. Don't sit and get caught up all, all the time. Because it gets a little bit difficult as time goes on. Be a good listener. Learn to listen. Don't always be the one talking. Because sometimes you talk until you hear yourself. And when you begin to answer yourself, then you know you're in trouble. When you start saying good morning, then you tell yourself good morning. Where are you going? I'm going to the bathroom. Then you are in serious trouble. So it's very important that you be a very good listener in the process. And don't be afraid for people to criticize you. When you deal with President Selling, if you don't, if everything is rosy, you're, going, you're not going to get her to be happy. She's going to challenge you that there has to be something wrong with either you or you don't understand the issue. So as a leader, you must be willing to accept different opinions in the process. And don't be afraid to go the way that you think that nobody is going. I hope that during our questions and answers and our discussions, we have the chance to be able to, to talk, and I give you some more practical examples. Thank you very much.